Joanne, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, hi. Hi, it's Glenn. Um, I'm not sure what to do next. It's not letting me do video. So we're going to start in this room um, in a few minutes. This room will be open up to the uh, attendees, the students, um, in at 4.15, so just a few minutes. Um, I'm not sure we'll, if we're going to have video, so I'll try again at 4.15 to see if we're going to have video. Okay. Okay. No, no, no problem. I just wanted to make sure I was in the right place. It looks like uh, we have the ability to turn on our video now if we wanted to. Well, I got to think says unable to start video because the host has stopped it. Yeah, I can't start my video either. Okay. Well, see, Joanne is special, which we know is true. So she gets her video. <laughs> okay, no video. Hi, Joanne. This is Montana from Harris Studios to help you guys today. I think if you hit like the video sign that has the cross through it by the participants, I think they could show their video. No, it's, it's still getting a window. You can't start your video because the host has stopped it. Yes, I think if Joanne does it to your videos on the participant side. So Montana, now that you're host, because um, I can't seem to figure out how to um, click it off when I was the host before. Sure thing. I'll look into it. Thank you. For those that have joined us as attendees, uh, we'll be getting started in just one minute. We're um, getting the video started for some other panelists. Thanks for waiting. Good afternoon. Sounds good. Try Thank now. You. 
try now to put your videos on. Thank you so much, Montana. No problem. Okay, it's working now, thank you. Are we still able to share this, the one slide? Montana, how do you want to deal with presentations and um, giving presentation rights to our panelists? Um, I have no problem like letting them um, have access to it at any time. Just let me know who needs access. Okay. All right. Um, just about ready to get started. I'm going to introduce the room and give everybody a framework on how this will work. And then I'm literally just going to go in my panelists. I'm going to start from the top and then we'll start with your presentations. Um, Okay, well, welcome to room three. Um, this is your world, uh, community and public safety. I'm your host, Joanne Brown. I'm also chair of community board 14, welcome. Uh, we have some really great panelists today um, who they're gonna tell you a little bit about their organization. Um, and I believe we have the chat enabled. So if you have any questions, please feel free to put the questions in the chat. Um, <clears throat> so, how this works is um, we have three sessions. The first session uh, will be 45 minutes. This session is going to go until 5.05. Um, so we'll be here to answer your questions, listen to the presentations from our panelists. And um, after that, um, if you could, I'll call on each organization and they'll introduce themselves with a quick two minute synops synopsis of their services. Um, and then we can have a Q&A session, all right? Um, all right, so let's go ahead. So the first organization that I have in my list is um, Brooklyn South Community. Oh, I don't see the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> Brooklyn South Community <laughs> Emergency Response Team. Oh, thank you, okay. All right, so I'm gonna kick it off to you. Um, two minute synopsis about what certain Hi, my name is Glenn Wallen and I am a CERT team chief. CERT is uh, a group of trained volunteers who will come together in a disaster such as a, a hurricane or uh, an earthquake or something that hits the city that's big. We are trained second responders. And if you look at my initial video, there is a website there that you can go to if you wish to sign up. It's a 10 week training. One evening a week for three hours to learn how to do things like light search and rescue, disaster medical, um, recon, things of that sort so that we can help our neighbors in a disaster. The main thing that I'm interested in getting across today is personal disaster preparedness or emergency readiness. What can you do now to be prepared if something were to happen? Now, all certain team members throughout the city um, do have to do this. It's very important. Um, think of it this way. God forbid there's a fire in your home and you go running out of your home as you watch everything burn. Wouldn't it be nice if you had a go bag with lots of things in it um, to help you continue the, along the way? You may have things in there like copies of all your important papers in a Ziploc bag and change of clothes, toiletries, medication, uh, many, many possible things. Also, if you have to shelter in place for a period of time, what do you need to do that? Well, there's a program called Ready New York. Again, the website is in my initial video, uh, and I'm happy to talk further about this, uh, with lots of, of pamphlets available for you to be able to figure out what you can do now to be prepared. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Glenn. Um, the next person I have on my list, the name is Louis Engelhart. What organization are you from? And um, welcome. Hello. Now I'm here with Glenn. Oh. We're with the, we're with the, the Brooklyn the South CERT team. Um, we just 
came to Great. represent our team and all the things that Glenn just mentioned. Our team in particular has worked a lot on communication. So we've invested with uh, some grant money from our councilman uh, in a lot of radio equipment that we do have trainings on uh, to enable emergency communications when any other source of, of getting in touch with anyone else is down, including cell phones if they happen not to be working. Um, so we've concentrated on that and we do drills periodically along those lines as well as uh, participating in community uh, presentations where we pass out Ready New York uh, information and literature and those sorts of things. So that's, that's a, little bit, a little bit more about our CERT team. Thank you. Um, the next organization I have is Housing Pres Preservation and Development. Hello folks, my name is Uriah Johnson and I'm a neighborhood planner at Housing Preservation and Development or HPD. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit about a, a project that we're doing with HPD and they are, are excited to uh, welcome some youth and youth, uh, young youth professionals uh, to, to engage on. Um, it's called the Flatbush African Burial Ground Redevelopment and uh, Re Redevelopment Task Force. So we've been conducting some uh, community workshops uh, and doing some engagement in the neighborhood. And there is a specific focus for this project, uh, which will be developed for affordable housing, uh, but also for future youth programming at this site. Uh, and it's located at 20, 282 Church Avenue. Um, so right in the, on the edge of Community District 14. Um, and we're just, uh, I'm here to just, you know, inform folks about a community survey that we have. Um, and also to invite you all out to a workshop that's happening this Saturday um, to ask about what type of affordable housing will be, uh, should be here uh, and what other types of non-residential programs like youth services uh, should also be programmed at the site. Um, so my, my, my job is, uh, as an urban planner for the agency is really to get people excited about future projects. Um, and I see Sean Campbell on, on the line here too. Hello, Sean. Uh, we've been working really closely with her to uh, spread the word about this uh, event. So I'm going to post the questionnaire in the chat, but I'm happy to answer any questions about the uh, urban planning profession or what we do with the agency. Excuse me. Thank you very much for that. Um, the next organization that I have is from FDNY Office of Recruitment and Retention. Uh, would that be you, Jonathan? Here. Good afternoon. Yes, ma'am. That would be me. I'm here with my colleague, uh, Terry, as well. We're here to talk about the employment uh, opportunities with the New York City Fire Department. We will be talking about how to become a firefighter, EMT, or paramedic. And uh, we're excited to be here. Yeah, as my colleague stated, uh, we're here doing recruitment for EMTs and firefighters and paramedics also. So um, we just want everyone to know that this is a great job that exists in the communities where everyone that resides in New York City, there's a local firehouse or EMS station in your vicinity. So we're going to talk about requirements, pay, of course, and we're willy, willing and happy to answer any questions or inquiries anybody may have. Like I said, my name is Terry. I've been on the job 13 years. I've been loving every minute. Can't see myself doing anything else. Thank you so much for that. And um, to our attendees, I see we have some attendees. If you check out the chat, um, our panelists have dropped some um, links in the chat so you can check those out as well um, for further information about their organizations. Um, the next uh, organization that I have is Multiplying Good. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Janae, uh, Miss Janae, and I work for Multiplying Good, where we have an awesome program called Students in Action. Um, as I mentioned in my video, it's all about uh, student leadership, student service, and student recognition. And so in short, what we do is we help young people figure out what they're passionate about and how they can use those passions and interests in order to make a difference in their community. Um, so we're actually all throughout New York City, um, and we actually come to schools um, to make this program happen. So you don't even have to leave your area, we will come to you, but we do have opportunities for you to get involved and meet other young people from across the city. So I'm super excited to share more with you all. Um, I'll pop our website into the chat and I look forward to, to chatting with everyone. Thank you very much. 
Um, the next organization I have is the Girl Scouts of New York City. Welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. My name's Margie. Um, I do work for Girl Scouts and I'm here today to tell our youth of how you can volunteer in your community. Um, we do have a lot of programs. Um, we're here for, to teach girls how to be leaders in their community. And you guys can get community service and we're help us with community projects by joining a community troop. And I know some of you guys have reached 18 where you guys can actually come back and actually be a troop leader. Um, these positions, these volunteer positions that actually look really good on a resume or you might need um, a recommendation for a job. Um, it's a really good experience to be a troop leader, um, any 18 and above, and we can put you to work. I can put my email address if you guys have any other questions in the link or our website and you can take a look at it. Um, and there's a lot of community service. I know you guys probably need it for school and for other things that you're working on. So if you have any questions, I'll be here and that's what I'm here to talk about today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, to the panelists who have put some items in the chat, um, if you've only posted them to the panelists, can you change the delivery to both panelists and attendees so our attendees can see those links as well? Thank you. Um, the, next, um, the next person that I have up is New York City Commission on Human, sorry, I don't see your whole thing, um, but you know who you are, New York City Commission on Human, you can take the floor. On human rights, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Abraham Tejeda. I'm an associate human rights specialist at the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Uh, our role as an agency is to enforce the city's anti-discrimination law. So if folks ever feel like they may have experienced discrimination in housing, employment, public spaces, um, discriminatory harassment, or bias-based profiling by law enforcement, we are the agency through which you would address those concerns. Um, one of the great things about the commission is that in, we do hire students. We do hire students in the past. And um, I actually started at the commission as a student myself. So I'm open to answering any questions that folks may have about the commission or about working here. Um, and thank you for having us. Uh, I know my colleague is on the line, but I'm not sure um, if she's able to unmute now, but thank you. I am here. I'm Edward Renaud. I'm also an associate human rights specialist. Um, I just uh, put all of our information on our chat, the uh, information line, our website, and our names and emails as well. So if you guys uh, need to reach us. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I see we have three attendees. Um, I'm not sure how we can, uh, they can interact with us via chat. Um, I'd like to open the floor up to questions. Um, I just wanna maybe wanna see if our host is available. I just have a quick question. Uh, Montana, do you have a second? Sure thing. Um, so just correct me if I'm wrong. Our attendees are interacting with us via chat, yes? Yes. Okay. All right, so I wanted to open the floor up for uh, questions and answers. So please do go ahead and put your questions in the chat. Um, and I also, if, if you feel like you don't have anything that you wanted to um, ask, you know, maybe I can ask some questions of our uh, attendees. So I'm waiting for your feedback, attendees. Um, let me start. Um, with housing and preservation, I, I um, we have a little bit more time to talk about um, the project, which is in our district, um, the African Burial Ground Task Force. Um, I'm not sure if there was anything that you wanted to add about that. It's a pretty expansive project, and we have um, we only gave you two minutes in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, I would love to, to say a little bit more. So the site that uh, it, uh, that we're talking about uh, is, is actually uh, a site of very uh, grave significance. Um, there is uh, some site history attached to the site. Uh, it's actually next, if anyone knows the, the neighborhood well, it's next door to Erasmus High School. Um, so they could site there. Uh, and actually a portion of the site uh, was found through archeological study. It was actually, uh, 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 formerly an African burial ground. Uh, um, and so 
the city is looking to develop it for affordable housing, but of course also look to uh, honor the history and memorialize it um, for, for, for future use uh, and include that in the development program with, along the, with the housing. Um, so we've been working really closely with this uh, community board as a task force member uh, to inform how we should be engaging with the community. Um, and we've had one workshop that was specifically on that site history and getting folks to understand um, how some ideas about how the site could be honored uh, through the design of future design of the building and, and some um, possibly open space that could be on the site. Um, and this next workshop is more focused on, on the housing, um, but we'll also have a focus on, you know, the youth programming and residential uses, um, a non-residential use, excuse me, uh, that could be programmed here. So uh, a portion of the, the because the, the site is uh, slated for youth development, programming. Uh, we really want to hear from our young people in the neighborhood about what they are interested in and what they want to see uh, a hub for. Uh, if there's any types of programs or uh, like technology or uh, homework help or even, um, you know, workforce development for some of our older youth uh, that they would want to see and have access to right in their home. Uh, we're, we're opening that survey in, in these community workshops to have you invite you come, to come and, and vocalize you know exactly what you want to see here so um, that's a little bit about it I'll actually post again into the chat the the website and the questionnaire the website has a ton of information about the site history and also all of the different um, workshops and, and task force meetings we've had to just kind of get us to this point today. Um, so if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer it um, and, and, and say more about the, the project. Thank you. Um, just to plug our CD14 Youth Council, again, I'm sure they would be great partners um, in um, helping you um, extrapolate what the youth of the community is interested in and the site. Um, not seeing any questions. Um, but really looking, it's really a great website with tons of history and I really encourage the attendees to, to check it out. Um, perhaps um, from the uh, New York City, uh, from uh, New York City Fire Department, perhaps you wanted to just to maybe anecdotally tell a little bit about uh, your experience um, being part of the FDNY um, so our youth attendees can get a little bit better sense of what it means to be uh, EMT or a uh, firefighter. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, can you hear me? Okay. I, hi, uh, yeah, I'll speak a little, more, a little bit about the FDNY. Um, Jonathan and I, we're both firefighters. He came in from the EMT route. So he, at one point he was a paramedic or EMT and he took the promotion to rise through the ranks as to be a firefighter. Me, I'm former military, so I took the open competitive. So I was taking the exam with 50,000 other people, you know, for 11,000 jobs, you know? So uh, it was a great, it's a great experience because you get to work in the communities to serve the communities where you are from and grow, grew up or live now. So it's very rewarding when you can help, you know, people in a, dangerous situation, you know, like maybe car crash, fires, of course, um, gas leaks, uh, collapses. So we respond to all kinds of emergencies, um, hazardous chemical spills, you know, explosions and uh, a whole bunch of other things as, as you can imagine. So um, I feel it's a great job, but I wouldn't just say to any um, interested prospects to just like, you know, tunnel vision for fire department, I would say take all other exams take sanitation, take police officer, take correction, take court officer, ranger, you know, because you don't, you want to give yourself as much, as many options as you can for your future, because having a city job, to me, it's, it's great, because when I was overseas in the military, you know, I seen, I saw a lot of, you know, underdeveloped countries, and I realized I'm from America, one of, probably one of the best two, top three countries on earth, so why not get a job and stay where I'm from, where my family is, where my friends, where I grew up. So I basically work for a fire engine, maybe 10 minutes away from where I grew up and where I live. So it's a great commute there and never, never two days, never two tours are the same. So I'm very grateful for this opportunity. 
So I'll let Jonathan speak on his uh, experience. Good afternoon. Um, I will be talking about the EMS. Like I, like my colleague said, I came through EMS, so I became an EMT, and then I took the promotional exam, which is about every four or five years. Um, uh, the salary to become when you start in salary for EMT it starts at thirty five thousand two hundred and fifty four. Uh, after one year, it will be thirty seven thousand. Two years, thirty seven nine hundred. After five years, you will be making over fifty thousand dollars plus nine differential over time and meal money. Uh, it was a great experience becoming an EMT. I was able to help out the community and get to know a little bit more about the 911 system and the pre-hospital care. Um, you get a very good benefits, uh, three weeks of pay vacation, five weeks after eight years, we have a 401k plan, shift differential and meal money, excellent promotional opportunities. If you decide to stay in the EMS command, you will be able to to join the ranks of lieutenant, cap, captain, or become a paramedic. So there are a lot of opportunities and it's a great way to start working for the department. So if you have any questions, we're here to answer them. Um, I don't have any questions in the chat, but I have a question. Um, is there um, an education requirement? Is there, um, can uh, you take the test straight over high school or do you have to have some college? Well, um, EMT for one, uh, you have to be 18, minimum of 18 with a high school diploma or um, educational equivalency. You have to have a six month satisfactory work history. That doesn't mean you have to work six months straight. You could have a work as a counselor in two, last year, two months. Uh, this year worked at Starbucks and then other two months worked at uh, you know, retail. But as long as they come up to six months, like I said, it doesn't have to be consecutive, but it has to, it will equal a six month satisfactory work history. So that, and you have to be at 18. Also, um, you don't have to have a driver's license while you're applying, but by the time you get appointed, meaning when you go through all the process, you have to have a driver's license to be appointed as an EMT or a New York City firefighter. And it's also excellent benefits, flexible schedule, and uh, medical benefits for the rest of your life, as, long as, as well as your family. So I just felt had to mention that. One of the key differences or the requirement differences for the EMS, EMT and firefighter is that for an EMT, you're not, you don't have to be a US citizen. You could just be a permanent resident. In order to become a firefighter, you will need that citizenship by the time you're appointed. Great to know, thank you so much. And um, <clears throat> thank you both for your services to our city and our country. We appreciate that. Uh, we're also here. If anyone has any questions later on, we'll be here to answer them. But thanks for the opportunity to speak. Thanks for being here. Um, uh, uh, Multiplying Good, did you want to add some more um, about your organization and how our district youth can engage with you? Sure, absolutely. Um, so basically, as I mentioned, Students in Action um, come in parts, it actually happens in schools. So basically the best way to get involved is to contact me. I can put my contact information in the chat um, and then we can talk about how to bring it to your school. And so what's really great about it, or even to an organization doesn't have to be a school. But what's really great about it, as I mentioned, there is a lot of self-exploration that happens in order to figure out what you really care about. Um, we wanna make sure that this is youth led. And so we don't wanna just say, oh, you need to work on this project or that project. We want you to dig deep, figure out what you care about, figure out what your community needs and how you can, again, use what you care about or how, you know, the assets that you have, the skills that you have in order to really get into your community and make a difference there. Um, we also host conferences during the year. So this year it was virtual, but it was still an opportunity to come together and meet students from the Bronx, from Manhattan, from other parts of Brooklyn, all over the city to share ideas on really how to be change makers of the future. Um, and similar to the Girl Scouts, this is something that you can put on your resume. Um, this is something that you can use to get those hours that you need for graduation. So we're super excited to offer this completely free of charge to have young people really get involved and really start to make a difference. Thank you. This this also sounds really perfect for a um, a presentation to our 
um, CB14 Youth Council. Uh, I think they would get a lot out of having a connection with you and the Girl Scouts. That would be great. That would be great. Thanks. Um, since, since we've been plugging the Girl Scouts, did you want to add some more, Margie, to your presentation? Uh, I don't have any uh, questions from attendees yet. Sorry, I was muting myself again. I apologize. Um, yeah, what I can tell them is exactly what like actually a troop is, because I know I was saying like community troop, but just because they're not part of the Girl Scouts, they might not understand. Um, a, a troop would be about 10 to 15 girls that would get together and they would do community service and our programs are all girl led. So maybe if a one girl might have a real high interest in science, that troop might be more to do science patches and science activities. Um, and as they get older, you know, everything becomes a little bit more responsible in the community and doing better service projects. I know that this group is a 14 to 21, correct me if I'm wrong, right? Is that, okay. So all the troops are led by two adults, 18 and over. You can't have two 18 year olds running um, a troop, but you can have an 18 year old and a 21 year old running a troop. So either one, just like um, it was just said, all of this stuff would be good for service hours for graduations. I know some people make sacraments that also need. And right now, after the pandemic, I know a lot of youths are having a lot of problems finding the service hours. We put together virtual service hours where people weren't even leaving the safety of their own home. And we were allowing them to do service projects online with our help. And we were showing them where to mail their project to and exactly what to do. Um, so like I said, I put my email in the chat. I really would highly recommend you know, emailing me, letting me know how many service hours you need and what we can do to work together to try to get you these service hours. And if there's something else that you're looking for, you can always check out our website. I'll also add that into the chat and you can see the other programs and events that we also offer at this time. That's fantastic um, and really innovative that you were able to manage uh, getting kids service hours during the pandemic remotely. So <clears throat> we'll definitely, um, We'll definitely reach out also about um, presenting to our youth council so that we can engage with them as well. Um, uh, sir, did you want to talk a little bit more about how um, the youth can engage with you, uh, age requirements, uh, things, Jeremy? Sorry, getting them on board with your organization. Uh, sure. Uh, the age requirement is 18 uh, or above. So there's not uh, a lot of folks um, who might be listening who will be eligible, but if you are over 18 and you want to help the community, then you just go to uh, uh, the website, which I, I put in the chat and uh, you'll find out how you can sign up for the training. Uh, as a team, the way we engage in the community is uh, under normal circumstances, that is pre-COVID and hopefully coming up soon. Uh, we'll do the things like this, the Zoom, but also in the spring in June in our district, uh, Community Board 14, there is the Mardi Gras, the street fair on Avenue M, and we set up a table, we talk to people, and we give out Ready New York literature. We do the same thing, uh, National Night Out in August, and uh, the Flatbush Frolic in September, on Cortelli Road. Uh, we also will go to uh, any organization that invites us to do a presentation on CERT and Ready New York. Uh, we've sent out letters to all of the local religious organizations at Community Board 14 and been invited to a few of them to do presentations. Um, the Ready New York component is really the biggest part of what we do to try and get individuals in the city to be as prepared as possible so that when an emergency or disaster happens, which does happen occasionally, Sandy was the last big disaster that hit New York. Um, it is possible uh, in our lifetimes that we may see something much larger than that. It's also possible we won't for the next hundred years, but it's a good idea for as many people as possible to take some steps to be prepared. And that's the primary thing that we try to motivate um, for people to do. Anyone who's interested in helping their community, um, it, this program is run through NYSEM, New York City Emergency Management. And we are very, very happy to accept new volunteers into the program. 
Uh, if you happen to live outside of Community Board 14, that's fine. There are teams pretty much in every community district. Um, I think that's about all I can offer for now. And I'd just like to say, if we have any attendees listening, it may seem a little intimidating to ask questions, but please feel free to do so as if you were at our, right in front of us at our table, uh, because we really do want to answer questions and help people become familiar with well, all of the services that this group has to offer. Thank you. So Glenn, uh, was there anything specific that um, CERT did during the pandemic? Were you charged with any particular uh, assignments or tasks to contribute? Um, not so much. Uh, the way the CERT training goes is <clears throat> they ask you who's number one. So the idea is that under all circumstances, first you take care of yourself, then your immediate family and your immediate neighbors, so that you are in a position to help other people. Um, and with the pandemic, um, many of us are a little bit older, so we had to take care of ourselves. So we weren't uh, asked to go out as a team, although some search from around the city were asked to go to one of the warehouses to help NYSEM with the food uh, and water distribution that they were doing. And many CERT members did volunteer for that. Our team has a pretty good supply of things. So we distributed, uh, we had at the very beginning of last April, I guess, we distributed some masks, um, some MREs and things like that that we had. Um, a few of our members knew of a few medical personnel and they distributed some masks to them, the N95 masks. Um, which is pretty much all we were able to do, but we're always looking to do what we can. Thank you. Um, I see we have a new <clears throat> attendee. We just want to encourage if you have any questions for our panelists, uh, go ahead and put them in the chat. I'm looking forward to answering all of your questions. Um, and let's see. Um, for and then lastly, New York City Commission on Human Rights, was there any um, thing that you wanted to expand upon on your presentation? Uh, let our youth know how they can get involved, etc. Um, and the way we deal with young folks, um, we do have a peer mediation program where we go into uh, you know, uh, high schools and um, public schools and uh, teach them you know, the skills on you know, how to manage you know, their frustrations, their anger, so that we can reduce the violence that usually go, goes on. So um, it's about an eight to 10 week uh, of a program uh, where we have sessions you know, in the schools, whether is during uh, 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 school hours uh, for some uh, high school or after schools. It's very intense. And then at the end, they do get a certificate. But you know, um, dialogue is open for them to express themselves and also learn you know, skills. Uh, we also uh, sometimes have um, had SYEP students and I saw myself, um, I have had very positive results with the uh, students that I have uh, supervised. You know, um, I have mentored many of them through college and masters. And I think um, the best uh, result I have so far is one that is uh, getting a PhD in clinical psychology and has already opened her own practice. So, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very, 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 very happy about that and see that, you know, I have gotten the fruits of my labor by really supporting uh, these young folks. And we do have, you know, other programs. Um, I will let uh, Abe talk about it because he deals a lot with youth as well. Yeah, thanks, I wish. So in addition to um, the peer mediation that Edwidge mentioned, we also throughout the year have other programs. So like earlier this year, we did a round table about police interactions. So really trying to engage the community and find out um, you know, what issues, if any, they have with police, how we can heal the kind of the gap 
between the police and the community in light of like a lot of the events that that happened last year. Um, another part, of one of those youth projects was a project where we collected art from different people around the city um, and we displayed it on our website and on another platform. So again, just really trying to engage the youth in New York City and allow their voices to be heard. So um, my colleague dropped the, the website in the chat. So I would encourage everybody to check out the website and you can find out how to get more involved with our youth programs. Um, and also, I know my colleague mentioned um, SYEP, and I'm, I know I mentioned my experience before at the commission. So when I started working at the commission, I actually started off as an intern, and I was part of the commission's um, discrimination testing program. So essentially, my job was to go out with other folks and you know apply for jobs, apply for apartments, um, go for different opportunities, and try to determine um, if discrimination was happening in situations where it had been alleged. So I would um, keep an eye out on our website as well, because that's when you'll find the job opportunities. <laughs> so if you're trying to work, that's the great place to check to see if any testing opportunities are opened up. Um, and you can have an opportunity to do that type of work if that's something you're interested in. Um, I, I think um, that's about it. But if you have any questions, you know, we're always happy to answer and try to address any concerns or thoughts you may have about the work that we do. Um. Glenn wanted us to just hear um, uh, a little bit from Lewis about the radios and I guess the acquisition of the radios. And then after we hear from Lewis, um, I just wanna open the floor because we have about 10 minutes left for you to be able to ask questions to each other because I also find it as much as this is a networking opportunity for our students, it's also a networking opportunity for you. So I want you to be able to ask each other questions if, if you wanted to get to know each other a little better. So Lewis, did you have something you wanted to add about search radios? Lewis, you're on mute. Okay, hear me? I'm yeah. coming in now? <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, when we looked around to see or thought around what could we, what could we concentrate on? Um, the search program, by the way, uh, once you're involved in it, uh, provides opportunities for all sorts of different training that uh, provided by NISIM on many different topics um, to anyone who's, who's actually a member and they're encouraged to go and do that outside of their, their individual group and then report it back. In our case, we, uh, we decided to make the investment is, is looking, looking over the history of many kinds of emergency situations. One of the key sort of tripping points that enable an emergency to sort of devolve into, into a disaster is the failure of communications. People just don't know what's going on. They can't be informed. Different emergency responders may not be able to coordinate with each other. Now we are basically in a support role, but we decided to make our, make our major effort in acquiring communication equipment and trying to learn how to use it. So as a backstop to the emergency responders, if we're, um, just doing search and rescue, doing general reconnaissance, perhaps traffic control, some of these kinds of things which we would be able to do, we can keep in contact with, uh, with our individual team members and also with anybody who we may uh, need to report to. So we first acquired some of the Midland radios, which you can buy kind of much online, um, after which uh, NISIM actually began to be interested in sort of promoting more, more structure in the radio training program and we gained access to, uh, I think it's CDW, uh, uh, Community Disaster Services has a radio set up all over the city. They're a citywide network and they've been involved in many issues in the past, basically sort of sidestepping or uh, adding, adding additional capability to the New York City's uh, department's uh, communications. And we have access to several of their channels and we use a 400 megahertz radio, which we have uh, Quite a few handhelds which are kind of like walkie talkies and as we developed our skills we're able to get base stations which are higher powered uh, uh, radios that operate on the same channels we have uh, uh, external uh, mass mounted antennas and a lot of what our uh, our uh, exercises involve is learning how to manage these kind of uh, radios on a network because they are they're not cell phones they can be interrupted if two people decide to try to talk at the same time. So it requires training and a little bit of discipline and a little bit of thought before you press that send button and start to talk. And these are the kind of things we've been working on over time. 
and it's not a it's a perishable skill so we try to keep up with doing that and uh, we have been beginning to offer that uh, that sort of training to other cert teams around the city and even more recently than that the city is now also uh, incorporated what they call citywide radios there are 700 megahertz uh, digital trunking network and every uh, every team or district uh, gets access to have one of those radios and those are kind of they work like magic i think bus drivers and ambulance drivers probably fire department people uh, perhaps even the police operate using radios which are very similar to that their reception when they work is miraculous you can talk to staten island the far ends of the bronx as easily as you can talk to someone in the next in the next block but with that capability comes the responsibility of knowing that it's also a network and if you if you use it abuse it or don't know how to use it you can tangle up the entire city uh, with cross communications so we've been involved in in working with those radios i'm a member of the radio advisory committee which works with nisum to promote training for those radios you sort of progress through uh, learning how to use the 400 megahertz the uh, point to point what we call a point to point radio and when you've become en familiar enough with that that you realize what can go wrong if you mishandle the radio then you offer the ability to be trained in the citywide radio uh, which gives you much more power much more range much more capability and along with that the responsibility of again not uh, not tangling up communications so right. all of our efforts have been in that regard and uh, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. If you're interested in, in radio technology or want to know a little bit more about it, we sort of have a way, a window in toward that. Several of our members are ham licensed, although that's not part of the radio uh, main capability that we offer, but it's certainly another thing that, uh, that we've all come in contact with. Great. Okay. So, <laughs> thank you. So at this point, we have about, about five, four or five minutes left. Um, did any of you have questions for each other? I don't have any questions from students. I don't have a question either, but I'm just letting you guys know that there were a couple of uh, job opportunities at the commission. So I have uh, the information, the website is on the chat. So I know that one of them um, is uh, requesting someone with a law degree, but the others do not. So um, feel free to uh, pass it on you know to anybody you think might need a job or if any of you guys want to <laughs> transfer to us <laughs> thank you very much sure. <laughs> um any other questions uh, do you have access to the information of how many attendees are are in this room there was uh there's been a few in and out we have three people with us right now thank you yeah um, I do have, I have one question about the attendees. I don't know if you're allowed to tell me, um, are there any girls in there in the attendees or is it, because if it's just boys that I'm speaking to recruit girls, I'll be honest, we're Girl Scouts. Um, I mean, it's hard to tell. I just see names. Oh uh, no, it's okay. If you don't know, it's not a big deal. Yeah. I wasn't entirely sure just by name alone. Okay. But we have, um, we have, a. Uh, two sessions after this. So hopefully we'll get some of the people from the other um, breakout rooms over here. And, um, you know. I'm sure it's probably a little early. They just got out of school and maybe right. a little bit later they'll be settled. Right. Um, all right. So um, that being said, we have only two minutes left and I'm sure everybody would like a little bit of a break. We're going to um, if you're scheduled to come back to this room, we're going to reconvene at 5.05 um, and see if we have a new audience. Um, and I'm ha also happy to answer any questions about the community board um, you may have, um, or I'll see you in a little bit. Do we, uh, do we stay logged in? Um, let me ask Montana. Montana, do we stay logged in? Uh, do we exit the room? Do we just, you know, mute ourselves? And I guess you guys just mute yourselves. Um, if you're staying in this session, like in this room, then you just stay here and mute yourselves and then wait for the next like guests to come in and stuff like that. Okay, perfect. So yeah, turn your video off, mute yourself, and uh, we'll see you back here at 505 if you're coming back. Okay. Thank you so much. You guys are great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
We'll be getting started in just a minute. It's 5.04. I want to welcome all of our panelists back. Uh, if you're in earshot, <laughs> hi everyone. This is the start of uh, session two. Um, this is room number three. It's called Your World, Community, and Public Safety. Hi, I'm Joanne Brown. I'll be your host today. I'm also chair of Community Board 14. Welcome. Um, to our attendees, um, this session is going to go until uh, 5.50. We have really great groups here to answer your questions um, once they are finished with their presentation. Um, and I really look forward to hearing from you. Don't make me call on you. <laughs> um, so uh, how this works, um, we're going to listen to about a two minute presentation from each of our organizations. Um, and then we'll open up the floor to your questions. Uh, feel free to drop your question in the chat um, and I will read it out to them and they will answer for you. Just let me know who that, who that question is for. Um, let me get back to my list. And so again, welcome to room three. I'm just gonna go ahead and start from the top of my panelist list. Uh, that means that um, CERT, uh, Brooklyn South Community CERT, is uh, up for their two-minute presentation. Hi, my name is Glenn Wallen. I'm a CERT team chief. That is a community emergency response team. Uh, we are all over the city based on each community district. And we are trained volunteers by the New York City Emergency Management. Um, our job is to uh, come together to help our neighbors uh, when the first responders are overwhelmed, such as in a major hurricane or an earthquake or something really large. Um, short of that, we do practice things such as uh, running radio exercises, but we also interact with the community by going to street fairs and setting up tables and doing presentations for any organization that uh, invites us. Uh, a primary thing is to get information out to people about emergency readiness through a program called Ready New York. If you look at our video or in the chat, I put the website, uh, which is newyorkcity.gov, always slash Ready New York, and you can get information on how to prepare now um, for any type of disaster. Uh, it doesn't have to be a, a citywide disaster. It could be a personal disaster, such as a fire in your home. Um, how to be prepared for that, to have a go bag, uh, and so forth. So uh, that's basically it. Uh, I'm open to questions, happy to answer any questions about anything. Um, you do need to be 18 or older uh, to apply for the training, uh, but everybody can work on the disaster preparedness segment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Glenn. Um, the next presentation will be from the New York City Depart uh, Fire Department, uh, Jonathan Mejia and Terry LaFontaine. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having us here. Uh, today, we're gonna be talking about how to become a New York City firefighter or EMT. Um, we have a lot of information on our website, joinfdny.com. I shared the uh, information. I think you accidentally muted yourself. There you are. You're good. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Firefighter Mejia. I'm a New York City firefighter. I'm here with my colleague, Terry. Uh, we're going to be talking about how to become a firefighter and 
and we're going to be talking about the careers within the EMS uh, command. If you have any questions, please let us know. Hi, um, as my colleague stated, we're our firefighters with the New York City Fire Department. We're here doing recruitment for firefighters, paramedics, and our EMT and EMS trainee. So <clears throat> we're gonna talk about some of the requirements, the pay scale, the responsibilities, and you know, the process of becoming, you know, having acquiring a career with the FDNY. So this is a great platform to speak to attendees and the panelists. I just want to say thank you for joining us today. I know you could have been doing something else, but you're here, you know, reaching out to attendees. So we'll speak more about, you know, more um, endeavors with the FDNY and we're here to answer any questions or inquiries. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Um, and to our attendees that are listening, um, feel free to scroll through the chat. There's um, lots of good links there from you from the first session, um, just in case um, the, our presenter isn't able to add all of that good information again. So feel free to scroll through the chat. Um, the next presentation is from Housing, and Pres uh, Housing Preservation and Development. Thank you, Joanne. Hello folks, young people and youth professionals. My name is Uriah Johnson. I'm a neighborhood planner with the agency, uh, HPD. Um, and my job really is as an urban planner to engage communities on new housing opportunities and new housing projects that are coming out of the agency. Um, and oftentimes with those new housing projects come uh, an opportunity to program non-residential uh, uh, programs or, or services uh, at, uh, in addition to the housing that's developed. Uh, so that's Part of the reason why I'm here today to tell you a little bit about a project that's going on in the Flatbush neighborhood. It's called the Flatbush African Burial Ground and uh, Redevelopment and Remembrance Project. Uh, so this, this is a great opportunity for uh, uh, new affordable housing, but also specifically for youth programming to come to the area, more youth programming in the future. Um, so I'm gonna drop in the chat uh, uh, a link to a community questionnaire that we've been circulating um, and also a link to the website so you can hear a little bit more about this site. Uh, this site is very significant. Um, it has uh, some, um, some history attached to it. It was uh, formerly, uh, a par portion of the site was formerly an African burial ground back in the 1800s. Um, and so the, this new site is, is a, not only an opportunity for new housing, uh, but possibly a, a chance to you know, memorialize the site's history uh, and, and also provide some important youth programming uh, in, in, in addition to the housing once again. So I've dropped this survey in and I'll also drop in uh, our website, um, the task force website where you can learn a little bit more about the project and the site history um, and also get a link to the uh, the community workshop that's happening this Saturday at 10 a.m. over Zoom, uh, where you can learn a lot more about the, the project and, and the affordable housing to come. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, next presentation will be from Multiplying Good. Hello, everybody. My name is Ms. Janae, and I work for an organization called Multiplying Good, where we have a program called Students in Action that's all about student leadership, recognition, and service. And so the idea is that we really help you all, as young people, figure out what you're passionate about, what you're interested in, and how to use those passions and interests in order to make a difference in your community. So if you've ever had a thought like, oh, you know, my school would be better if it had X, or my community needs Y, um, that's really what we're all about, is really getting you to figure out um, kind of innovative ways to, to, in, um, to improve your community and then giving you the skills and the tools that you need to do so. Um, so we come into your school, we, um, we help you, you know, work through this self-exploration, this community exploration component, and then really get you started um, working in your community to make it better. We also host um, conferences throughout the year. This year it was virtual, but you still, have, you still had an opportunity to come and meet students from all over the city. So I'm excited to be here to answer your questions and to hopefully bring students in action to your school. Thank you very much. Uh, the next presentation will be from uh, Girl Scouts. Uh, yes. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you again for having me here. 
Um, I know some of you guys already heard me talk, but I'm here looking to see if any youths need community service. Um, we are an organization, a nonprofit organization that um, we develop troops in our neighborhoods and we go through the community service and it's girl led. Um, we strive on leadership development and community, um, I'm sorry, uh, community development. And what it is, is I know a lot of you guys need for your sacraments or for graduation, or even maybe a resume that you're making, you need community service and you need recommendations. And we can do that through a community troop. Um, troops are about 10 to 15 girls and they normally have two leaders. I know some of you might be a little bit old for that, but at 18, you can actually be a leader of a troop. And if you're thinking of being a teacher or any kind of occupation working with children, that would look really good on your resume or your application when you go to apply. Um, I know some of you guys need it for high school credits and for college. So I'll put my email in and if it's anything here that you're interested in, you can go ahead and reach out to me. That's it, thank you guys. Thank you. Uh, the next presentation will be, <clears throat> excuse me, from the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Hi everyone, my name is Edwidge Menard. I am an AARF Associate Human Rights Specialist with the Commission on Human Rights. Uh, the commission's mission is to educate the public on their rights in the city of New York. You're not allowed to be discriminated against because of certain characteristics, such as your race color, your ethnicity, and now it's rampant with uh, people of Asian descent. They're denied housing, you know, employment. Also, uh, a lot of Black people are being, you know, denied services just because they are. And uh, those are all protected classes with the uh, human rights law. And, you know, uh, it should not happen. So if it does happen to you, you can come and file complaints with the Commission on Human Rights, and we will investigate you know, your complaints. Um, we also go out and do presentations on the law. And it's not only on the, you know, human rights law, but we have uh, several other areas that we cover, such as housing, you know, public accommodation. Um, so this is what we do. Uh, we have a law enforcement bureau where these investigations, you know, happen, but, we are from the community service centers, me and my colleague, uh, Abraham Tejeda, which will uh, say a few words as well. We are the mouth of the commission. So we're the ones who go out there to educate you on your rights. Uh, so that if you ever have a complaint, you will know that we are there for you and you can come and file your complaints with us free of charge. Now, a lot of um, young folks uh, may not think that this has anything to do with them, but you know, you might uh, want to go to a public place, you might go to a restaurant. And as a matter of fact, that example I saw on TV the other day, um, a couple of um, black uh, folks went to a restaurant and they had on, uh, they didn't have on, uh, you know, ties and suit, but you know, they were well dressed, you know, with sweats and they denied them entry. As they were leaving, there was a group of, you know, white, uh, folks coming in with shorts, flip-flops, caps, and they went right in. So of course, you know, yeah, the, the Black folks went in and, and complained to the manager about it. I don't think they had any intentions of filing complaints, but they did speak to the manager and he said he will, you know, uh, speak to his staff, you know, about it. But these are the thing, kind of things that can happen and they happen a lot with young folks. Uh, just going to the uh, department store, going to Macy's to buy some stuff. And you will see that they will uh, follow, security guards will follow certain folks and not others. So a lot of times, uh, as I said before, young people think that the law is not for them because they're not, you know, buying homes, you know, and stuff like that. However, it happens to everyone. And also when we are talking about uh, fast food restaurants, you know, they should know that if they're working, uh, um, shifts just like adults, they should get paid the same. But a lot of times they will pay young ones, you know, less than, 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 than full adults. And if they're uh, uh, working the same shifts, they should be paid equally. So these things, you know, uh, happen to young people as well. So I will allow uh, uh, 
my colleague to continue because as I said before, not only do um, we take complaints of discrimination, but we do presentations as well in a lot of different areas. Also uh, very specific to young folks. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Edwish. I'll be brief because I know um, the time, but yeah, my name is Abraham Tejeda. I'm also a human rights specialist at the Commission on Human Rights. Um, and as my colleague said, in addition to all the wonderful programs that she mentioned and different areas that the law covers, we also have a lot of youth programming that's available. Um, so we have groups that meet regularly that will discuss different issues uh, related to the law that my colleague was mentioning. And then also throughout the year, we'll have different um, events uh, to target folks and engage them throughout the year, right? So whether it's about discrimination, whether it's about pride, um, in, a, in one's particular heritage, right? Reaching out to young people all across the city, trying to build community within, within um, young people from all across the city um, and allowing them to kind of speak about the, the city that they would like to see. Um, so I know last year, our most popular programs uh, were, in, were an art program. And we also, like I mentioned, had multiple round tables and different events. Um, we also host many public facing events, most of which have been through Zoom uh, during the, this pandemic. Um, but in any event, if you have any questions about what we do, um, I'm going to drop our information in the chat. Um, you can feel free to visit our website, reach out to Edwidge and I if you want to know more about the commission. Ah, thank you everyone so much for your presentations. I want to open up the floor to what I imagine are some bright smiling faces that are attending this um, these presentations in this room, we want to hear your questions. So feel free to drop your questions in the chat um, and we will get them answered for you. Um, also, you know, there's uh, some additional information from session one if you want to scroll up in the chat just to check out the links. But um, we would really love to hear from you. So I see, I see six uh, smiling faces in the attendee list. So go ahead and ask your question. Um, and while we wait for you to uh, send those to us, I'm just going to go back and um, have some of our organizations expand on their presentations. Uh, we just wanted you to hear a little bit about each of them in the beginning, um, and then perhaps that will provoke more questions. Um, so housing preservation and development, we'd really like to hear more about this project that you have going on in our district. Um, and I would, we would really like to hear what maybe if you know of any youth um, feedback that you've gotten about the site, that would be great too. Yeah, sure. Um, so if you're joining late, uh, once again, the uh, project that we're working on in, in CD14 is called the Flatbush African Burial Ground uh, Redevelopment and Remembrance Project. Um, and this is an initiative to develop affordable housing on a vacant site that's right next door to Erasmus High School. Um, and, and it's also opportunity to uh, memorialize and honor uh, some significant site um, site history that happened at this uh, at this location. A uh, portion of the site was formerly used as an African burial ground uh, back in the 18, up until the 1840s. Um, so uh, with along with the housing, uh, there's a chance to, to program the, the uh, building that could be here uh, with youth services. Um, and we're really looking for feedback from uh, youth leaders and, and youth themselves about what services are needed or, or desired in, in the, the community. So we, we've been doing some outreach on, on, on the project uh, since about mid-April. Um, and we have a couple of teachers um, and, and that are on the, the task force. Um, there's a, a list of organizations of all the organizations that are task force members on the, the website if you wanna learn more. Um, but with COVID and, and everything that's going on, we've tried to, you know, station in front of Erasmus, but we really want to hear more feedback from our youth about what kind of programs they want to see here. So there's a, there's a, a host of different opportunities that, you know, you can choose from, um, but we really want to hear from you 
uh, on what that should be. So that could be anything from, you know, GRE prep or, or test prep. It could be, uh, you know, more programming for tech uh, or, or, or computer science. Um, so some, some non-traditional things that you maybe can't find in your neighborhood, but you want to engage in. Um, and also opportunity to connect it a little bit more to the, the significant history. Um, a lot of times we hear about, you know, old things that's happening or, or old things that happen in our community and we're not really sure how it connects to our, our everyday, but this is a really great opportunity to, uh, you know, bridge the, the, the old with, you know, the future and, and you, the present. So um, I've posted into the chat the uh, website for the, uh, the project. And then I'll also be post. I'll also be posting uh, that youth engagement survey uh, that, and and I hope that all of you will, you know, spread the word, um, send it to your friends, have your parents uh, uh, fill it out, your teachers, and let them know what's going on in Flatbush. It's, it's a really important project. So thank you for for allowing me to share a little bit. Oh, thank you for uh, expanding on that project specifically. Um, and to our attendees, um, we have newly formed uh, a Community Board 14 Youth Council. Uh, these, um, these students uh, will act as their own volunteer committee. Um, they will attend meetings, um, Community Board meetings, both general and if they choose other committee meetings, and uh, they will host their own presentations um, from organizations just like this, from housing pre preservation, the Girl Scouts, um, and uh, some of the other panelists that we have here, a multiplying good. Um, so we encourage you to actually look on our website, because if you're not looking on our website, you're missing a lot of good stuff. Um, and you can find more information about the Youth Council. Um, I wanted to ask uh, the representatives from the fire department to go ahead and maybe tell us a little bit about um, uh, uh, recruitment requirements um, and maybe perhaps share their own story um, on how they decided to move into this line of work. And we're still waiting for your questions, uh, our youth and uh, youth attendees. Okay, um, how you doing? Thanks again, Ms. Joanne. Uh, my name is Terry. I'm with my colleague and friend, uh, Firefighter Mejia. We're both firefighters with the New York City Fire Department. We came in different routes. He came in through the EMS route and got promoted to firefighter. While I was a military veteran, I came and I took the open competitive test. Uh, nevertheless, we're here. We're um, performing a job that we love and we, we'll talk about uh, requirements and uh, uh, <clears throat> some of your um, responsibilities in, in this job. So uh, we're talking about EMS and EMT first because the firefighter test we don't have any concrete date when it will be given that's why we say visit DCAS to see what tests what city exam because that's the department of citywide exam um, system and uh, if you visit that you'll know what tests are coming or what tests are open so that's very important plus um, Jonathan and and I will leave some um, very important emails, uh, I mean, websites where you can visit and they'll show you some more details about what the job entails. So uh, EMT you, and firefighter, you have to be at least uh, 18 for EMS, 21 minimum age. Uh, firefighters cut off at 29 and a half and there's no cutoff age for EMT or EMS. And you can go through these routes to become a firefighter. Like I mentioned, the firefighter test isn't open. However, if you take the EMS route, you can, like Jonathan did, get promoted through that ranks. So one of the requirements, you have to be 18, right? You need, for both jobs, you need a, e, uh, a high school diploma or equivalency, and you need a six month work history, meaning you can have a job for maybe two months here or a job last year for a month and maybe this year, another two job, but it has to add up to six months. So two, two and two or two, two, one, one, whatever, but it has to add up to six. So that's very important. And you must be a resident of New York City to be a firefighter, whereas EMT, you can live anywhere in this tri-state area. Uh, Jonathan has more of the figures as far as the pay scale, but I just want y'all to know that we both love this job and it's a great opportunity for a career. And when I say visit DCAS, there's also other jobs being offered. I mean, filing periods to 
so you can file for the upcoming exams, whether it be police, a corrections, court officer, firefighter, sanitation, park rangers, you should always look at every option because you can never have enough options. You always have something to look for if something doesn't go through your route. So I just, we um, encourage y'all to visit our websites because if we miss something, the website will always have information for you. So I'll give it to Jonathan to his speak. Correct. So, um... Yeah, um, Jonathan, your volume is real low. I just wanted to say, uh, I hardly hear you. Okay, so like like Terry mentioned, uh, we have a lot of information on the FDNY, join FDNY website. You could uh, get some more details about how to become a firefighter, the requirements and what's out there. Like Terry mentioned, uh, there is no firefighter exam open at this time, we're working on the one that was given a couple of years ago. However, if you join as an EMT, you you have um, you have the opportunity to start working for the department a lot sooner. Until so, if you're 18 between 18 and 21, you could start and then get promoted when that becomes available to firefighter. If you don't want to become a firefighter but you want to stay with the uh, EMS command. You could, you could uh, take a promotion to become a paramedic. Now, keep in mind that all this training, are, it's going to be free. You're going to get paid and be an employee, a city employee, while you're getting all this training. And that's very important because you're not investing money into something that you don't know if it's going to work out. So you're going to get paid to get the EMT certification. Um, and you're going to receive uniforms all the books and everything you need to become an EMT or paramedic. Uh, if you decide to go fire route, you will take the promotion. If not, you could stay and become a paramedic, a lieutenant or a captain. So if you have any questions for us, it will make it very easy and a little bit more fun if you uh, give us your questions and we'll answer. If you don't have any questions at this time, please join uh, go to join FDNY and get more information. Oh, I'd just like to mention on that, uh, if anybody is uncomfortable with asking us a question or typing, you can actually um, give us your email and we'll email you through the department, through the FDNY email. So that way you can have, if you have any questions, you can, we'll get it through email and we'll respond back. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks both for your service to um, New York City and to our country. Um, the next organization, I think we, I still don't have any questions in the chat. Come on, guys, we're waiting for your questions. Um, let's hear from uh, Multiplying Good and all the good work that they're doing. Oh, oh, wait, I have a hand up from Sean Campbell. Is that your hand? <laughs> Yeah, I, I just wanted to um, point out that I did put the link to the YLC in the chat. It's also on our on our website, of course. And um, I just so that the panelists know, we are recording this and it will be a, a resource on the uh, the website. So, so that uh, just don't worry about our shy attendees who aren't asking questions because they'll have a link to your to your organizations from our website and our youth uh, conference page. Um, and maybe we'll scare up a question before we before we conclude. So <laughs> thanks for your patience with that. But, um, and, and uh, pass on the link too. We'd love to have more YLC members. Thanks, Joanne. <clears throat> Thank you, Sean. Um, yep, yeah, so the link is to, to our attendees, the link to the Youth Leadership Council is in the chat. So check it out, definitely. Um, so back to multiplying good, sorry for the interruption. We'd love to hear about all the good work you're doing. She's having connectivity issues. Um, so we're just gonna give her a minute to um, get uh, that sorted out. Um, let me go on to, um, sir, did you wanna add some to your, uh, um, to your presentation specifically, you know, any additional information on how our youth can get involved in uh, qualifications or um, age limits? Well, there's two things, uh, first, uh, I'd like to just hold this up, see if, if people can read it. This is how you can access the Ready New York information. I'm not sure if you can read it, I hope. And then I'd like to turn it over to Lewis for a minute to talk about our radio program, because it really is quite interesting for anyone who's interested in, 
any type of radios. Lewis? Yeah. Uh, our team, uh, since its inception, decided to in, invest its, a lot of time and energy in radio communications, realizing that in many emergencies in the past that uh, failure of radio communication or failure of communication in general, um, think of the Titanic, you know, fruitlessly trying to wireless SOS and shooting rockets in the air um, as an, a rather extreme example, but more recent examples have always been anytime there's a problem in communication, and sometimes that is related to radio communication, an emergency can devolve into a disaster very quickly and it's very hard to recover from it because no one knows what everyone else is doing and there's very little information that's effectively um, exchanged. So we've devoted our, a lot of our energy into acquiring radios and training ourselves and training others in the CERT program to effectively use radios. And we consider radios to be the backup um, communication uh, means if the things that we're used to using all the time, particularly cell phones, um, are not working or overloaded. In the case of, a, of one of the sort of major examples that we think of as a possibility that would create an emergency situation large enough to really over, overtax emergency responders and cause widespread disruption in communications would be something like a hurricane where the power failures, multiple power failures and cell towers become disabled or a lot of people try to use them and they become overloaded. So the radios that we are working with are simpler radios, what you might call walkie talkies or line of sight radios. Um, they require their ranges, perhaps a quarter mile, half a mile, depending on things that you actually become more familiar with how radios work when you try to make them work in the field, which I think would be interesting for anyone who, who joins our teams um, to be able to do that because we talk about the theory of radio, not in a lot of detail, but just enough in general to operate the equipment. And then we go out in the field with the radios using a network protocol where people are, are uh, trained that a radio like that does not work if two people are trying to talk at the same time. Um, you'd probably even notice that on cell phones. If you're trying to talk with someone, it, your communication may become chopped up because the cell phone is actually parceling out back and forth communication and is nowhere near as sophisticated on a line of sight radio. So we devoted a lot of time in that. We, re, we know it's a uh, perishable skill. So we try to drill on it all the time. And lastly, we've also uh, NISM, which is New York City Emergency Management, has begun to support this effort uh, for all the teams across the city. And they've also instituted a new uh, radio unit, which they're providing to all the teams used uh, using licenses that the city uses on a 700 megahertz digital trunking network. And these radios are, are given perhaps one to each district or one to each team because they're so powerful. Um, their communication clarity generally is crystal clear all over the city. You can talk to someone here in Brooklyn in the far end of the Bronx or the far end of Staten Island, uh, very clear. They're similar to what radios I think are used by bus drivers and policemen and firemen, similar type of technology. And that requires training because with the additional power uh, is added the additional responsibility of again, if two people are talking at the same time, no clear messages get through. So we've devoted quite a bit of time for that. So anyone who's interested in that, uh, we get additional information and the opportunity to learn. And, in addition, and besides that, NISM does provide the emergency management uh, authority that we work with, provides training in many, many other areas besides just communication. Um, when you're a member of CERT, you can, uh, you can access those trainings. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. And uh, for our youth attendees, you know, um, if you're uh, of the age to participate, this sounds like an incredible volunteer opportunity with some very experienced folks who have actually um, experienced a, a citywide emergencies and had to uh, be called into action. Um, so waiting for your questions, my youth attendees. Um, next, I wanted to call on Ms. Smith from Multiplying Good, and she can tell us a little bit more about her good work. Thank you, and thanks, y'all, for your patience as I work through my technology issues. Um, so yes, as I mentioned earlier, um, our young people really get an opportunity to figure out what's important to them. We want all of our projects to be youth-led. Just to give you an example of some of the projects that were done this year, even in the midst of COVID, we had a school that was really passionate about um, mental health. We actually had two schools that were passionate about mental health. So one school decided 
excuse the background noise, one school decided to address this passion by actually working with the elderly population and collecting stories from the elderly via Zoom um, to then take to their younger classmates and have their younger classmates really um, summarize what they learned through art. So that was really great. It was a great way to kind of do a cross-generational um, impactful project. And then we had another team also focusing on mental health awareness and they wanted to educate their peers on what to look out for um, as it pertains to certain mental illnesses that, or mental health issues that it's not just, oh, get over it or, oh, you're fine, but that there may be serious issues. So they did a workshop with their peers and they also did a workshop for parents um, in order to show folks how to support each other. So there's a variety of different ways that you can be involved um, in Students in Action. There's a variety of different projects that you can do, whether we're in person or virtual come the fall. Um, so yeah, I, I would love to answer any questions you all may have and speak more about bringing it to your, to your school. Thank you very much. Um, and we have about uh, 10 minutes left. Um, still looking for the questions from our youth attendees. Um, but we wanted to bring back the New York City Commission uh, on Human Rights to tell us a little bit more about how um, you can be part of um, their mission. I'm going to defer to uh, Abe uh, so uh, he can talk a little bit about um, his experience at the commission since he started as a volunteer and then transitioned as a full employee. Um, I think uh, the youth will relate uh, to him more than I because I've been uh, young a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> not that, not that long ago, not that long ago. It was you still, still got it. Um, but yeah, thank you. Right. So one of the things I failed to mention during this intro, but I did earlier to all the attendees who are present, is that um, when I first started at the commission, my first job there was actually to be a discrimination tester. So. I was a college student at that time. I needed to make some money. I needed a part-time job. And I found an advertisement for a position at the commission. Um, at that time, the, the categorization was, was called college aid, right? And I applied and I ended up getting it, right? And working at the commission as a discrimination tester. And so a lot of my work, um, you know, in addition to doing kind of like the administrative things that you might expect for an entry level position, um, was also to actually go out and visit places that were under investigation for discrimination, um, along with other testers, and try to determine, you know, if folks in fact were being treated differently there. And so, like, that was kind of like my first experience, right, um, in that type of workplace. I had had a different type of job before, uh, but it was my first time having, like, an office job, kind of having administrative responsibilities, kind of using some of those writing and reading skills that I learned in college in the workplace. Um, so I, you know, I always think about that story because now, you know, I'm still working at the commission many, many years later, right, in a different position now. But that was kind of like my opportunity, right? Like I, I started working there, um, you know, learned a great deal about the work, ended up leading a team uh, a few years, a couple years down the line when after I was a tester. Um, and then, you know, when someone had retired, you know, folks had let me know that the opening was there and encouraged me to apply. Um, and so, you know, I was able to get that position and, and now, you know, I kind of have a, a, a full city position with all the different benefits that some of my other city colleagues have mentioned. Um, and I'm still here at the commission, right? So, you know, I say that to kind of relate to folks that, you know, if you are in that position, you know, the commission might be a good place for you to reach out to. Um, I, I'm not certain 100% if we're hiring testers at this particular moment. I didn't see the postings that we have currently, but I know it rotates. So every so often, right, every semester, they may hire some different people. So I would encourage you to, to re visit our website, which was in the chat. Um, if this is something you're interested in, if you have ever been interested in discrimination or, you know, in the city agency that deals with kind of administrative law, this would be probably be a good place for you to be. Um, you know, in my time as, as a tester, you know, I was also really able to learn about all the different nuances of the law, which kind of translates into my job now, because um, as Edwidge mentioned, our job is kind of like to educate people about the law, right? Like our, our agency enforces the law, but Edwidge and I's role is, is more so to engage the public and educate people about their rights and responsibilities under the law. So if this is something that, you know, you'd be interested in, if you're also kind of in that spot where you need a little extra money, um, the commission might be a good a good place for you. 
um, where you can have like a, a reasonable load of work and, and be contributing to something that's that's very meaningful uh, and also kind of get the money that you may need to, to finish your schooling. Um, and, you know, if, again, right, if you have any questions about that, you know, definitely reach out to me, type it in the chat. You know, if you can, you're hesitant to um, tag everybody, see if you can message me directly, I'll answer whatever questions you have. Uh, you can email me, it was in the chat as well. And, and again, I'm also going to encourage folks to visit our website um, to tap into some of the youth opportunities, right? I, I don't lead the youth team, but we work closely with them. Um, you know, you should definitely tap in if you're interested in engaging with other youth around the city around these issues that we're facing um, and trying to shape, shape the city to a more inclusive city that we all know it can be and that we all want it to be. So um, that being said, you know, I'll close there if there's any, any questions. To add in general, to let the young folks know that if they're looking for jobs and maybe they're not finding something right away, uh, think about volunteering where you would like to work because you know you will ha already have a rapport, you know, uh, with that organization. And I'm sure that once they have an opening, you will be the first one they will look at because they've already been, you know, accustomed to your work habits, you know. And I'm sure they will give you preference. So if you can't find the job, you know, you want, try volunteering and you would probably end up at that place later on. Thank you both. And, and thank you so much for sharing that story about your experience. And uh, it, it's a, um, it's a good, a, a good uh, example of how someone can join an organization young and just grow with that organization. And, um, uh, our presenters mentioned earlier how, you know, their re relationship with um, youth employees uh, is also a mentoring opportunity. And you told this lovely story how you just had someone graduate with their PhD uh, in clinical psychology. Uh, and, and that was really, um, and this was her mentor or, or uh, he or she, I'm not sure, sorry. Um, so we have about five minutes left. Uh, attendees, feel free to put your questions. Joanne, you just muted. Thanks. If anybody has questions for each other or if, you know, um, you uh, would like to network, but what I'm really looking forward to is having um, these organizations back to meet with our youth, count, youth council um, so that they can hear about all the good that work that you're doing um, and they can benefit from, benefit from it as well. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, we do still have four. Oh, I see a hand up. Whose hand is that? Oh, it's it. Oh, oh, I'll see. Uh, uh, oh. sorry. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, it I didn't want to speak out of turn, but I was just wondering when the youth council was, was starting up, but is there a schedule that we should look out for? So Sean, um, the, I believe the council has been chosen or it's still an application phase? The, the, the application is on a rolling basis. Right now we have um, 12, 12 members of the council. We have eight that have been pretty active. Um, you know, we will, they've taken some initiative on things they're interested in and did, for instance, a, a tour of the Copo food pantry. Um, and mm -hmm. so we're going to continue to work with them and plug them into opportunities in the community um, over the summer. But um, um, we would, uh, you know, it, it feels like we have capacity for, for more. And the it's been hard remotely getting them just sort of like this event, you know, getting people to engage remotely has been difficult. So I'm looking forward to the opportunity to try to bring them together um, in, in, you know, IRL um, and, um, and, and get them to begin networking with each other because the ultimate vision is for them to be fairly autonomous. Um, we've facilitated a lot of their work so far, but the idea is that, you know, they, they should have autonomy and not necessarily need um, a great deal of, um, you know, guidance from us. Um, does that answer your question? It's, you know, it's fluid, but it, but it's, it seems to be, you know, solidifying. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, looking forward to it growing. Yes. Me too, for sure. Uh, we can't wait to hear their voices um, uh, at our committee meetings as well. Um, we have about uh, like a minute and a half left. 
I uh, just wanna let everyone know who um, is an attendee and a panelist, this will be the end of session two and that will end at 5.50 and we will begin session three at 5.55. Um, District Manager Sean Campbell, I believe is gonna take over my role as host um, for the last session. And um, I just wanna thank you so very much for being here today um, and giving all this good information to our attendees and also sparking you know, our, um, our plans for the future and how we can include you um, in our committee meetings uh, with NR Youth Council. So thank you so much for being here today and, and I learned a lot. Um, so that's about it. So as um, Montana said, Montana is the moderator for this room, uh, Ms. Campbell. Um, we'll just mute and uh, shut our video off and then we'll, you'll return at 5.55 for a new group of attendees. And thank you so much. Bye.
Hi, Sean. Have you been to the other rooms? Yeah, I've been popping in and out of them. And, um, you know, there are there are just shy students with us today. So the, the Q&A hasn't been really um, um, vigorous in any of the rooms. Um, but I, if I haven't said it here, now I'm confused to where I've been and what I've said where. But if I haven't <laughs> said it here before, let me just make sure you all know that this will be up on our website as a resource um, for some time and that um, any students who have questions once they view it on the, on the website can, um, you know, you can can link to your organizations and agencies directly from the, the website um, or email us and we'll facilitate any questions. What what I'll do this time, because um, I don't want to misuse any any of your time, your valuable time. So we'll go through the introductions again. Um, I'm going to then do a check on how many attendees we have with us and, um, at, at, you know, to avoid just um, having you repeat into the, you know, into the screen. If you want to break early, we can do that. And then if you want to go to the youth conference website, um, you know, you can go into the other rooms as, as attendees if you want to see what's going on in the other rooms um, or get back to whatever other tasks you have at hand. So so um, before, uh, so I'll just say thank you again. I might say it three or four more times because I really am appreciative um, of your being here and um, you know for flying by the seat of your pants with us um, in this brave new world. Uh, so with that, we will go ahead and do the introductions one more time, um, if you would be so kind. Um, and I'm going to go ahead, I'm just going to kind of go in order of where I see you on my screen. So if I can start uh, with HPD, please. Sure thing. And thank you for having us. I'm really excited to, to be here and uh, to share a little bit more about the, the project uh, that we're working on with uh, in part but with uh, CD14. Um, my name is Uriah Johnson. I'm a neighborhood planner with the uh, Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Um, and really, I'm an urban planner, but my focus is really on community engagement uh, and letting folks, really, really New Yorkers know about new affordable housing projects that are coming to their area um, and, and additional opportunities to, to program non-residential programming, uh, like the site that I wanna to talk to you about today. Um, so uh, along with uh, some other folks in the community and, and um, CD14. Uh, we've been working with on a, uh, a project called the Flatbush African Burial Ground Redevelopment and Remembrance Project. Um, and this project is really to um, is, is dedicated to a site next door to Erasmus High School. Uh, it's currently vacant, but is uh, de designated for uh, affordable housing development, um, as well as programming for youth services. Um, so I'm here today to tell you a little bit more about that project, uh, about how to, find, how to find out more and to offer you an opportunity to also fill out a, a community survey um, to, to let us know a little bit more about uh, what are the needs for youth specifically in the community and what they would like to see or have more access to aside from the housing. So it's a really great opportunity to um, give your feedback on um, that, that housing piece, but also uh, how the youth programming and other non-residential programming could inform honoring and, and memorialization of this vacant site. Um, so thank you for having me once again. No, it's a pleasure and it's really been uh, great working with you and getting to know you and I just want to just tell everybody else how heroic you've been because we've engaged you on so many different the, the task force and we're talking about our um, our lunch and learn series which you can learn more about on the website and this and so thanks just for always being there um, and uh, and I'm looking forward to continued uh, work with you and the site, of course, the project at the site is really um, important and interesting and uh, we will work together to engage the community as, as deeply and profoundly as possible. Um, so thanks for that. Um, I'm also going to now I'm going to move on to Glenn Woolen from uh, from the CERT program and also sing his praises before he gets started because um, Glenn is a board member at CB14, as he may have mentioned, but is just is one of those stalwart board members who comes to everything as a as a presence on all of the committees beyond the one he's assigned to. Um, it has been at all of our youth uh, um, 
what are these youth conferences, um, bylaws committee, you name it. He's just a really, really dedicated, just sort of the, for, for the attendees um, who want to know what being involved in your community looks like, there's your dictionary definition. So with that, go ahead, Glenn, please. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. And uh, if any of the attendees are also interested in asking me questions about uh, community board membership, I'm happy to, to deal with that as well. But CERT, Community Emergency Response Team. We are a group of trained volunteers, trained to the New York City Emergency Management uh, to be second responders primarily. If a major disaster such as a hurricane or an earthquake would have hit New York and the first responders were overwhelmed, then we would come into play and we would use some of the skills that we were trained, which is things like reconnaissance, light search and rescue, disaster medical, uh, things of that sort. You need to be 18 uh, to become a member and you could uh, just Google CERT, C-E-R-T, or you could look at our short video that I, I posted as to how to go about volunteering for the training, which is once a week for 10 weeks, about three hours each week in an evening. Uh, our primary focus though, is how to get people ready for a disaster, personal disaster preparedness or emergency readiness. There is a New York City program called Ready New York. And that program has brochures as to the various things that you can do now to be prepared should some type of a disaster or emergency happen, such as how to put together a go bag. Now it doesn't have to be a citywide disaster for these things to be useful for you. Uh, if God forbid there's a fire in your home and you go running out, um, if you could grab your go bag, you can have lots of stuff that otherwise would be burning in the fire. For example, um, copies of all your important papers in a Ziploc bag, a uh, change of clothes, toiletries, maybe a little bit of money, uh, if you take medications, uh, so forth. There's, there's a long list of possible things. If you need to shelter in place, that is to stay in your home, but the city is shut down for a period of time, we want you to know how to go about doing that and what you could require now to help you get through that time. So that's the primary focus. Uh, how to get this information, I posted it in the chat as well as in the video. So thank you very much. Thanks, Glenn. Who's, who's gonna speak first from the uh, Commission on Human Rights? I can take that. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Abraham Tejeda. I'm an Associate Human Rights Specialist at the New York City Commission on Human Rights. If you don't know what the Commission on Human Rights is, we're basically New York City's anti-discrimination agency. Our job is to enforce the city's anti-discrimination law, which is called the Human Rights Law, and also to educate the public about their rights or responsibilities under that law. Um, so my colleague and I, uh, we mostly do um, community work, right, engaging the public, um, educating folks about their the uh, the their responsibilities and the role that the law might play in their life. Um, in addition to that, with with respect to the context of youth, we have a number of different programs that we do and we offer to youth. Um, one of which is peer mediation. I'll leave my colleague to speak a little bit more about that. But we also have a number of different youth programs that go on every year that are kind of focused on like whatever is going on that year. Um, you know, general celebrations of culture and heritage. Um, and things of that nature, right? So it's not always um, something that's on a strict time schedule, but something that evolves to whatever may be happening in the city in that moment. Uh, one of our most popular youth programs last year was a program where um, we collected art from youth all across the city, depicting their experiences in the city. Um, it's really beautiful. Check out the website. You should be able to find it there and also find all more information about uh, future uh, youth related programs and events and I'll, I'll leave some space for my colleague to speak, but thank you for having us. Hi, I'm Edward Menard, and I'm an Associate Human Rights Specialist with the Commission. Um, the peer mediation program is a, a program that we facilitate in high schools and some uh, uh, elementary schools, but mostly high schools where we provide the youth with skills to resolve their conflicts and to quell bullying and violence amongst themselves. Because as we know, uh, this violence sometimes uh, produces a lot of stress and anxiety and can even lead 
sometimes to suicide. So this is, you know, very important uh, work that we do. Uh, we also uh, have um, mentored SYEP students uh, yearly. And uh, my success story is that one of my mentees is now uh, getting her PhD in um, clinical psychology and she has already opened her own practice. So I am very proud of that. The our other success story is Abe himself, who started out, you know, volunteering at one of our programs, the testing program. And from that, you know, as a college student, he, you know, moved on to become, you know, a full-fledged employee of the commission. And he's here today presenting about the commission. So to me, that's also a success story. And as I was uh, uh, saying before uh, to all of you that are looking for jobs, um, if they do not find exactly what it is that they want right now to, <clears throat> excuse me, think about volunteering somewhere, you know, a type of job that they would like to do, because once you volunteer, you know, uh, you will have a rapport, you know, with the employee, you know, employees with your employer. And probably when there is an opening, you will be the first person they will call on. So volunteering, you know, uh, is a good thing as well. So I will leave you with that. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, we've been working with uh, uh, Sean at CB14 for a very long time. I've always participated in the conferences and they've always been very, very nicely attended. Unfortunately, with the COVID, we do, you know, dealing with Zoom, we don't have the same audience, but it is still, you know, uh, uh, a very, very, very good uh, uh, job for us to do, you know, to enlighten our, our children. Thank you so much. Our youth, I shouldn't say children. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I appreciate that, Ned, which I miss you. I mean, not only are you a, 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 a dependable uh, um, participant in this event, but you're always at our borough service cabinet meetings, or I should say district service cabinet meetings, and you always bring us um, really valuable information that serves our community well, because for those who don't know it, and there's no test at the end of this, so, so you don't have to take notes, but we are about the fifth most diverse a community district in the entire city out of 59. Um, there's something called the racial diversity index um, and we measure about fifth of 59. So uh, that we've got a public school that has 30 first languages spoken um, at, in, in the homes at our local public school, one of our local public schools. So the work you do really, the importance of it can't be overstated um, and you're just so lovely to work with. So um, thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, Yep. And uh, we're now at FDNY. I sort of watched you for your reaction when Glenn Willen said to have your go, your, your go bags ready um, in case the emergency is a house fire. But you've been really great partners with our community board and, um, and show up at our public safety committee meetings from time to time. And Sandra Sanchez is my liaison with the, uh, with the agency, always there with, with really good information. Um, and we like to prevent those house fires. Um, so we appreciate the work that you've done in educating our public. Um, so thank you for being here today too. And I'll let you go ahead and do your, your final introduction of the, of the uh, afternoon. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, hi, good afternoon. Good evening, all. Um, my name is Firefighter Terry Levantin. Um, I'm with my friend and colleague, Jonathan Mejia, and we're talking about um, careers with the FDNY in the capacity of EMS trainee and, and EMT. Uh, also firefighters, but there's no concrete date for, you know, the firefighter tests. However, um, we're doing EMS and EMT because those tests are given like uh, twice a year. So, <clears throat> What we're doing today, we're just trying to collect uh, like names or maybe emails so we can like forward information through um, our websites and whatnot. Because since we're doing these virtual meetings, we, well, we're used to being in the schools and going to events and, you know, uh, scheduling workshops. But, you know, since the COVID, we're doing it virtually. So we're just trying to operate the best we can. So um, EMS and EMT, I'll just speak about basic requirements. You have to be 18 years old to be an EMS. Uh, trainee or EMT, uh, you have to attend the academy, of course, but before that you have to have a um, high school diploma or equivalency, a six month work period. And uh, if you're a military veteran, that's another way to get in. And also um, some of the responsibilities that EMT and EMS um, 
trainees are responsible for. Um, as you probably know, responding to all emergencies via um, ambulances, responding to car crashes, whatever emergencies needed to transport victims to the hospital. So uh, you also, um, it's a great job. And it's also other ways to, like you have to be 18 to be an EMT, but you have to be 21 to be a firefighter. So you can be an EMT or EMS uh, technician. And in three years, when you turn 21, you could take a promotion to um, firefighter. I, I believe that's what Jonathan did. Like me, I took the open, and open competitive. So I was going against 60,000 people. Thank God for my military service because it gave me an extra five points. So that probably passed me thousands of people. So I'm grateful for that because this is a great job. I can't imagine myself doing anything else. I get to serve and protect the community where I'm from, where I live, where I grew up, where my friends, my family reside. So I get this great feeling jumping on the fire engine at any time of the day, because you never know what you're responding to. I just wanna let everyone know, like these are one of those jobs that, you know, is, is some danger involved in it. But, you know, as long as you rely on your training, your each other and communication, you'll, you'll be well, you'll handle your situation and you go home at the end of the night. So I'm gonna let Jonathan go because he's more admin savvy than I am. So I'll let him speak. Thank Good you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening. My name is Firefighter Jonathan Mejia. Um, I'm assigned to an engine company downtown Brooklyn. I've been a firefighter for over, over 10 years with the fire department. Um, I did start with EMS. I worked uh, three years as an EMT. It was a uh, a great uh, opportunity to start working for the department while I was waiting to become a firefighter. So I like to encourage everyone, all the attendees that are interested in helping their communities to join FDNY. And you can start by doing, by filling out the application to become an EMT. You will get paid as you get trained. And then after your, your the academy, you will be able to work in one of our 40 EMS stations. Um, the difference between EMT and EMT trainee is that to become an EMT with the New York City Fire Department, you're required to have an EMT certification from the New York State Department of Health. If you don't have that, or you don't want to make that investment and get that on your own, you could go ahead and apply as a civilian to the um, EMS trainee program. Basically the same training. The only difference is that you will be getting the certification first, the EMT certification. You're gonna be getting paid. You're gonna be given the uniforms and textbooks and everything you need to get that certification. And then you start the training um, the same as the EMT. The academy will be a couple of weeks longer because like I said, you need to get that certification first. Um, but it's a way, it's a great way to start your career with the New York City Fire Department. Um, to see, to get a better idea when the test will come out, I've shared the uh, website, joinfdny.com, and we'll post all, all of the information that you, that you need on the website. There's an option there to contact a recruiter. Uh, the contact information is there. So if you have any questions, you can reach out to us. I see that there are a lot of female attendees uh, in this particular session. I would like to encourage you to join the fire department. And there are plenty, uh, a lot of firefighters, female firefighters within the fire department. And that's uh, something that we're trying to recruit more females to, and, and minorities to diversify the fire department. There is a lot of training available and we're here to answer any questions. Yeah, I just wanted to add on to that. Um, not only fill out, you know, file for the fire department exam, file for any exam that's coming up because, you know, you want to keep your options open because you never know what lies, what your future lies, what lies in your future ahead of you. So uh, we would just encourage you to visit our website and make a determination what career would be best for you. So we're just one entity is a whole bunch of others when you visit the DCAS. So you'll get a real, a real whole lot of inf great, great information about careers, descript description of careers and responsibility careers. So I just want everyone to take a chance on themselves. 
Thank you for that. And, and I just want to um, I just want to make sure have we acknowledged that uh, and does everybody know already that today is actually National EMS Day. I, I have a statement from the governor that came into my e uh, my email box just a little while ago. Um, so it, it recognizes the, the heroic efforts that EMS workers put forth to to ensure that our our community was met with uh, with swift and respectful response to emergencies in this extremely difficult year. Um, so happy EMS days, guys. Thank you for thank you for your service. And just thank quickly you. also to acknowledge um, a lot of information that we've been getting throughout the year about uh, uh, FDNY's efforts to diversify the force for women, people of color. Um, you also have a good, a great support program for uh, gay and transgender uh, firefighters um, that we've received a lot of training on. Um, so thank you for for being inclusive and New York City's bravest. Um, in, in, in many ways, apparently. Um, I think, Louis, did you wanna add to the, CERT, to the CERT presentation or should I move on to Margaret and then circle back so we get all of our organizations in? I got the unmute. I, well, I talked before about radio, so I won't go into too much more about that. You all, we've, our team particularly has, uh, has concentrated on radio technology and training ourselves and how to operate radios over a network which I think is useful as useful skill. Uh, I, I kind of, it's come to me as I've listened to everyone that um, the one thing that, uh, that sort of volunteering and perhaps volunteering for a CERT organization in your community also provides is that you know, you get to know people. And a lot of the CERT leaderships in the different uh, boroughs around the city are people who have established themselves in careers. They're very wide range of expertise. It's really, quite amazing when I think about it, how many lawyers, managers, builders, engineers, things like that, who have devoted a little bit of time, they're generally a little older, they have some of the time to do that. But with that experience comes connections. And I think it was mentioned, uh, someone mentioned that if you volunteer, you become, you become known um, to people who then can put you in contact with other people. And you know, you, the old thing that you say is not all, always what you know, it's who you know. There is a certain a bit, a bit of that that I think is can be proved to be true. So in, investing some time and actually showing the discipline that it requires in the case of the CERT program to go through the training and to attend meetings and show enthusiasm, it puts you in direct connection with the with the staff and everybody at the at the NISA, the New York City Emergency Management, which right away is almost the home base for the policemen, the firemen and things like that, because that's where there, a lot of their efforts are coordinated in an emergency. And you also have access to people that you meet along the way um, and you're gonna get to know them and they may have uh, connections that can be very valuable to you. So that's a side benefit. You may say, well, they're not gonna pay me, I'm a volunteer and all that. But there is the capacity of uh, some, somebody saying, you know, we've got this guy, he's a young guy or this young, young woman has, has been with our, uh, our group now and she's interested in this and we may know people who know people and uh, it's possible that that can pan out. It's certainly another avenue to explore. Thank, thank you for that addition. And um, before we move on, I just wanna note, it looks like FD, you are looking at the chat and wanna make sure that you picked up the email address that's been provided uh, that, that uh, from Liza Hernandez, who's looking for information. I will, I'll copy it and forward it to you if, in case you don't get it. Um, so with that, if, if Margaret, are you with us? I am with you and I'm so Thank sorry my camera's off. It was on <laughs> earlier, but last panel, I turned it on and it was giving me warnings on my Wi-Fi and then it kicked me out of the panel. So I'm not even gonna risk it, I apologize. Um, but I'm happy that I'm here today and I'm happy that the attendees here are mostly girls. Um, because I am with the Girl Scouts of Greater New York, and we are actually here to just explain a little bit about ourselves. Um, we run on troops. We're a nonprofit organization. We are found in all the five boroughs, and we um, make girls into leaders, and we are based on, like, service projects and community service and just basically getting out in our community and making the world a better place. Uh, we build girls with um, confidence and courage. And I'm here today to tell you guys that if you are looking for some service hours, I know a lot of you guys need it for graduation. I've had some girls come to me for sacraments. 
I've had girls come to me because they were part of the National Honor Society. And I guess a prerequisite is that they need some service hours in their community. Um, a very fun way of earning your service hours is joining a community troop of Girl Scouts with other girls. And you guys can work on things right in your own community where you're from. Maybe you see something every day that maybe needs to change and you guys can take action and do it together, earning the service hours that you need. If you're a little bit older than that, we do definitely have a lot of positions for volunteers to run our troops. And if you're ever thinking about being like a teacher or any other position that's working with young children or a leader position, um, these look very good on a resume or a, a college application that, you know, you were a volunteer, you did work with Girl Scouts, or you earned this award with Girl Scouts, or you had service hours. I know it was said earlier on this panel that, you know, volunteering is really big and, and it could make a difference in getting a job or not. Two people with the same exact background can apply for it. And at the end of the day, maybe the one that has a little bit more volunteering might have gotten it because that was the one little thing they had different. So it does make a difference and it shows who you are. If you guys are interested in volunteering or earning any community service, or maybe you just want to be part of the community and do a little bit of good in your neighborhood, I will add my email to the chat and you guys can reach out to me. Um, that's it. That's all I have. Thank you. All good stuff. Thank you very much. Um, Janai Smith, last but certainly not least, if we could um, hear more from Multiplying Good. Certainly. Um, so also, I'm also having connectivity issues. I apologize, but I'm here. Um, so yes, Students in Action um, is a program of Multiplying Good, as our name sounds, or as our name suggests. Our mission is really to multiply the good that exists across the country. And so one of the ways we do that is through Students in Action, which is all about student leadership, service, and recognition. And so um, the idea is really to get young people fired up about the issue that they care about and then give them the skills and tools that they need in order to make a difference in their communities. And the great thing about it is that we actually give you um, the curriculum that's needed. We come to your school. We do workshops. Um, we actually even have an opportunity for peer-to-peer -peer workshops to really start digging deep into the issues that you care about. So we like to take it further than just, okay, let's do a, let's say a food drive. We like to think about, well, why do we need to do a food drive, right? What is food insecure? Why does food insecurity exist? Why does hunger exist? And what can we do to make sustainable changes? And so within that, um, again, we have these workshops that we do, but we also have conferences that um, take place during the year. Under normal circumstances, it would be in person, um, but it was virtual last year and it was still pretty great. You get an opportunity to meet students from across the city. And actually in this case, because of COVID, uh, our students had a chance to meet other students from across the country because we joined some of our virtual conferences together. And so the idea is that we want all of our projects to be student led and then we wanna celebrate those students um, through what we call our end of year celebration and competition where young people get to come together, share their ideas, share the impact that they've had, and then they walk away with banners and prizes and things like that. And so in short, um, if you have, you know, a concern about your community or if you just even want to make the world a better place in general, SIA is the way to do so, Students in Action is the way to do so, and I'll drop um, our website as well as my email in the chat. That's great, um, and um, I appreciate all of the information and we'll wait for your um, email to come back up. Um, again, there'll be links on the website directly to the um, to all participating organizations. I am gonna ask if any of our attendees have questions in this third and final session of today's uh, event. And you can ask your question by putting it in the chat by or the, the Q&A or by um, raising your hand. And we, I am not seeing any and given the um, the prior sessions being quiet for the Q and A, um, I will ask you all if there's anything you want to ask of each other or anything you want to add. Otherwise, um, I won't I won't keep you here. Um, we'll encourage you. I put the link to the youth conference in the chat. So if you want to link into other rooms and see what's going on there, if there's no questions to answer here, I would encourage you to do that. Um, anything? Any final? 
comments, questions, or remarks from anybody here? Have a good summer, everybody, and spring. <laughs> all right. And um, try to, to all the um, attendees, just look at every option that's coming your way. Just look, at least look into it. You don't have to like take the career or take the exam if you don't want to, but just see what works for you. I love that advice. Thank you. Thank you all, you are free to roam. Um, and thank you again for, for your participation today and for, for serving our community um, all, all days. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. See you, we'll see you at the next one. Such a pleasure. Yeah. All right. In person. <laughs> all right. Take care. All right. Bye. And thank you, Sean, for all the work you and your staff did putting this event together. So thank yeah. you. Thank you for the support in doing it, Glenn. Happy to be here. But now, see you soon, Sean. <laughs> Take care. We'll see you. We'll see you at our next event. Yes. <laughs>